Good morning. It is Wednesday, March the 10th. My name is Joe Haynes. I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church in Victoria, BC. Welcome to this morning devotional. We're looking at the book of Revelation in a series of uh, devotional expositions or expositional devotions. And today we are looking at Revelation 11 verse 7. So get your Bibles and turn with me to Revelation chapter 11 and let's read verses 1 through 7 and then we'll pray and discuss it. Revelation chapter 11. I'm reading in the English Standard Version. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth, and if any one would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If any one would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Let's stop there, even though it's mid-sentence, and we'll carry on the rest of that next time. Uh, but for this time, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on us, your people, as uh, the Revelation uh, chapter 1 has a promise for those who read and heed and and, and hear the words of the, the, this book and, and keep the things commanded in it, Lord. And so bless us, we pray, as we cling to your testimonies. Incline our hearts to your word, Lord, we pray. And teach us and feed us and nourish our souls by this living bread from your hand. By your Holy Spirit, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we can uh, turn to what happens in verse 8 and following as we look at the resurrection of the two witnesses and, and all that is meant there, uh, we need to study their death in verse 7. First, what does it mean in verse 7 that where it says, when they have finished their testimony? What does that describe? Because verse 7 is clear that they are not to be killed until that time of their testimony is over, until they've, they've, done, they've done what they've been sent to do. And second, what is this beast that rises from the bottomless pit? Uh, surely we need to understand that. And third, when and for how long does this beast make war on the two witnesses? All these things are things that we'll try to answer a little bit today so that we're prepared for what's to come later on uh, as we carry on in our study of Revelation. You know, it's not an accident that Revelation over and over again borrows from the, the analogy of the apostasy of the kingdom of Judah and the Babylonian exile. Because apostasy, apostasy doesn't happen in a church overnight. It doesn't happen in a nation overnight. It takes time and it follows a pattern. One of the great kings of Judah, you may remember, King Jehoshaphat, he understood how important it was for the sake of the health of his nation, for the people to hear and understand the scriptures. So Second Chronicles 17 verse 7 is one of my favorite uh, uh, just uh, hidden gems of the Old Testament. It tells us he sent out officials along with trained Levites to go through all the towns and the cities of Judah and teach God's word to the people. That was one of the sacred duties of the priesthood. Leviticus 10 verse 11 said, you are to teach, you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. They were called to teach as well as to do the other things that they were assigned to do as priests. But when that teaching stopped, the people, the nation wandered away from God. And it kept happening that way until Babylon invaded and took the nation into exile. After that, when God brought them back, again, you might remember Ezra saw how important it was for the people to hear and understand God's word. So after he read the scriptures to the whole assembly, uh, the Levites went through the crowds, uh, taking time to teach them and exposit it to explain what it meant that they'd heard. It says in Nehemiah 8, verse 7, 
They helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. This is one of the reasons that I'm passionate of, about giving you more than just a, a vague overview of the great and grand themes of the book of Revelation, like many preachers do. God's word is meant to be preached and heard and taught and understood in its fullness. And God's people are blessed when that happens. That, that's also why when only a faithful remnant uh, of churches remained that were, that were doing that, that were carefully and accurately and, and um, de teaching God's word uh, throughout much of Christian history, that's why the rest of the church fell into ignorance and then error and then apostasy. Again, this is why when only a faithful remnant of churches were doing this, the rest slid down that quick and slippery slope into apostasy. So we see here the words, when they have finished, in verse 7. When they have finished. The word finished, it's the same word as in Revelation 10, verse 7, about when the mystery of God will be fulfilled. It's the same word as in Revelation 15, verse 1, about the wrath of God being finished with the seven angels with the seven plagues. It's the same as in chapter 15, verse 8, when nobody can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels are finished. It's the same word Paul uses in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. That beautiful passage of his testimony where he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In each case uh, where we see the, these examples of the word finished being used, it describes a process that comes to an end. And we're talking here about a small number of Bible preaching churches that persevered in spite of persecution throughout the medieval period, the Middle Ages, throughout the, the, the period of time sometimes called the Dark Ages of Christian history. As though these are witnesses testifying in a court of law, because every time they testify to God's truth, they end up exposing the counterfeit. Every time they preach the gospel, even just by the fact of what they preach as they devote themselves to accurately interpreting and explaining the word of God, what they preach condemns high and mighty churches that don't do that. It took a long time, but finally all of their preaching began to uncover uh, the identity of this beast from the bottomless pit. And finally the time arrived when the faithfulness of the medieval martyrs fully exposed the great rebellion in God's church. And by the time that they were finished, that they'd finished doing what God sent them to do, they pointed their accusing fingers consistently at the same criminal. From the dawn of the Middle Ages, numerous witnesses became concerned by what they saw happening in Rome. As soon as the emperor made the popes the official authority over the whole Christian religion, that was by the decree of the Emperor Phocas in the year 606. The first pope called Gregory the Great, uh, he's a famous pope in history, uh, he's the first to take the title Papa or Pope as, as though he was a father of the people. And I think he, he was a well-intentioned leader and priest at that time. And he, he, he ruled as, as the first pope from about the year 590 to 604, if my research is right. And while by all accounts, he was a decent man and he was a good leader and he loved his people, uh, he was a terrible Bible teacher. Uh, we have to admit that. And yet he was one of the best Bible teachers compared to many of the popes that came after him. He, he didn't know biblical Hebrew and Greek and he didn't know, he hadn't studied the ancient Near Eastern culture and history. So he didn't know how to interpret the Bible very well. He didn't have the skills and the tools to do that. But he did love his people, and he, he, he did his best, I, I think, to teach his people well. Uh, but he, he says some, some things that, that we understand today, and even the later Catholic Church identified as heresy. So since they didn't have Bible commentaries and dictionaries like we do today, he was unequipped 
to teach and preach the Bible according to what the original writers, the prophets and apostles, what they meant to say. So he ends up coming to things that they never would have imagined that their writings would, would be taken to mean. And I need to say here that not every Bible teacher is going to have the ability to work with the original languages and to have a chance to study uh, ancient cultures and histories of the Old Testament, much less the New Testament. But in that case, such a Bible preacher needs to learn from reliable teachers before him, needs to sort of, sort of let uh, faithful preachers and teachers of the past guide him. Gregory didn't do that. He, he chose the worst of the examples before him. His so-called exposition of the book of Job, for example, concludes that Job represents Jesus, that the meaning of the book of Job is that Job is Jesus, that Job's wife is represents the flesh, you know, carnal nature, that Job's seven sons are the apostles, that Job's friends are the heretics, that the, the I think it's 7,000 sheep, that the 7,000 sheep are true Christians and so on. So he makes the, the actual meaning of the book of Job to be all about, you know, the New Testament. Where Job is actually the oldest book in the Bible. And it's, it's a book that's literally about the things that the writer wants to communicate. Not about whatever the preacher dreams up it might mean. And following that kind of example of medieval preachers during the Middle Ages and, uh, included many who I believe did their best to lead their churches. But really with widespread ignorance of how to how to do basic Bible interpretation, how to read a book, how to break down grammar and look to see what words mean and, and fit it together and see what is the author trying to say, how to preach the truth of the Word of God. And meanwhile, there were still some pockets of good Christians led by faithful and courageous pastors who cared more about being true to Christ's Word than about drawing crowds. They cared more about loving the Lord than about saving their own skin. And so these pockets of Christians that remained, they ended up being persecuted for their faithfulness to the Lord, for their fidelity to the Word of God. And there's an encouragement, I think, to be drawn here for pastors today who persevere and labor in good, solid Bible teaching without the publicity and the celebrity and the the sort of the, um, the, the affirmation of crowds of followers. If that's you, my friend, keep at it. Well, things went downhill from there. After the first Pope Gregory, uh, you know, uh, came into office, at that time he believed that the Bishop of Rome, that, that was, he was the Bishop of Rome, that, but he believed that office of the Bishop of Rome was to be first among five otherwise equal patriarchs of Constantinople and Alexandria and Antioch and Jerusalem. Uh, but they and he together, they he saw themselves as co-leaders of the church and the head of the church was Christ alone. That's how he saw it. After him, though, things got worse. More and more authority was over time ascribed and claimed by the popes until they claimed absolute authority over all churches. Not, not as bishops with co-leading co bishops and the other five major um, uh, metropolitan centers, but, but absolute authority over the whole church from the Bishop of Rome. And so first, what we see is first they made the word of Christ unintelligible by their allegorical preaching. And then they usurped the authority of Christ by claiming to rule in his place. Well, my friends, by the 10th century, the abuses and the immorality of the popes were so legendary that even the Bishop of Orleans tested against a, a whole series of popes with the words of 2 Thessalonians 2, claiming that the prophecy of the man of lawlessness was now fulfilled, what many call the Antichrist. So he said, Are there indeed any bold enough to maintain that the priests of the Lord over all the world are to take their law from monsters of guilt like these men, talking about the series of popes, branded men branded with ignominy, illiterate men, and ignorant alike of things human and divine? If holy fathers, we be bound to weigh in the balance the lives, the morals, and the attainments of the meanest candidate for the sacerdotal office, how much more ought we to look to the fitness of him who aspires to be the Lord and master of all priests? Yet how would it fare with us? 
if it should happen that the man the most deficient in all these virtues, one so abject as not to be worthy of the lowest place among the priesthood, should be chosen to fill the highest place of all. What would you say of such a one, when you behold him sitting upon the throne, glittering in purple and gold? Must he not be the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God and showing himself as God? That's from the Bishop of Orleans. The the when we look at these words here in Revelation 11, verse 7, the next phrase, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. Well, by the 1200s, the popes were ordering the deaths of witnesses all over Europe, of what we would call good evangelical Christians. But look at that phrase in verse 7, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war against them. I think it, it calls him the beast here for because of a reference to Daniel. It calls it uh, that he's coming from the bottomless pit here because it alludes to chapter 9 where the locusts and the smoke rose from the bottomless pit. Not saying that this is also uh, like that the, those locusts were the, the rise of Islam, but that the spiritual source of this um, office, of this uh, usurper, is the same spiritual source as where Islam came from. That is from the bottomless pit. But when we look at this phrase, that this beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war against them, uh, that the main part of that wording comes from Daniel 7, verse 21, where there's a new ruler rising in Rome right after the Roman Empire has fell, fall, the, the, fell right after the Roman Empire fell, the, the, the beast, the fourth beast of the book of Daniel. And then this, this new leader, this new ruler in Rome makes war against the saints. Well, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25 says, He will have authority over the saints for 1,260 years, taking the, the year for a day scale that we've talked about before. And the testimonial evidence here paints a compelling picture of how uh, early Christians understood these things and saw these things. In the early church, Irenaeus and Tertullian had shown from the Bible that this Antichrist would rise up once the Roman Empire was divided among ten kings. Well, we saw that that happened by about the year 600 AD. Chrysostom, the famous Greek preacher in Constantinople, said, When the Roman Empire is out of the way, then he, the Antichrist, will come. In a Christian's Pocket Guide to the Papacy, uh, uh, written in 2015, a wonderful little book, the writer says the Protestant Reformation was not the first movement that referred to the Pope as the Antichrist. A robust medieval European tradition, from the Waldensians to Wycliffe and down to the Hussites, had denounced the Pope in such a radical way. And that writer quotes from a website. And the website he quotes from is the website of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I looked it up to see if the quote was true, and it was where on that website of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, they admit that the claim the popes are the Antichrist goes back to the 11th century. So this testimony, identifying and pointing the finger at one criminal, had been happening for a long time before these witnesses were killed. Well, next we see this phrase in verse 7, the beast will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. So the beast attacked the witnesses in the Council of Tours in 1163, in the Third Lateran Council in 1179, in decrees by popes in 1183 and 1198, objecting Christians, Christians who, who couldn't go with the Catholic Church and follow the papacy by conscience and by biblical conviction, objecting Christians became outcasts. And then outcasts shortly became outlaws, and outlaws were hunted. The Inquisition began. In the 1200s, at least six Catholic councils aimed their proverbial guns at the church, the guns of the church at Christ's own followers, at, at, at the true church, against these stubborn Christians. And they made it illegal for non-clergy to have Bibles. So if you weren't a properly ordained Catholic priest and you were caught with the Bible, it was a serious crime. In England, the followers of Wycliffe were outlawed for their witness. In Bohemia, the followers of Huss. And the death toll climbed into the millions as the faithful, persevering, small, unaccepted, 
but true preachers and, and flocks of God were persecuted and hunted and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. This symbol here in verse 7 of killing the two witnesses, it describes the silencing of the witnesses of the true churches, true Christian churches, that had lasted over a thousand years. Their crime, why were they killed? Teaching and preaching the word of God. And then came the day when they were finally dead. On May 5th, May 5th and I'm quoting here, on May 5th, 1514, at the ninth session of the Fifth Lateran Council, the following announcement was proclaimed to Pope Leo X. There is an end of resistance to the papal rule and religion. Opposers there exist no more. The whole body of Christendom is now seen to be subjected to its head, that is, to thee. And for a time it looked like the beast had won, but verse 7 is not the end of the prophecy, is it? And the year 1514, when that famous decree and, and uh, admission that the, the witnesses were silenced and dead now, there were no more protesting voices against the authority of the popes, that year 1514 is not the end of history either. There's more to come. The story's not over yet. Remember, whose two witnesses are these? In verse 3, Jesus called them my two witnesses. One of the great lessons of scripture is also one of the great lessons of history. The word of God will not pass away. Scripture cannot be broken, as Jesus said. And Christianity, it isn't about the church. Christianity is not about your church. It is about Christ. Though the beast might have silenced the voices of so many martyrs, the beast was powerless to silence the word of Jesus Christ. If you're a pastor, rededicate yourself to preaching and teaching God's word, explaining every passage of scripture so that your flock can understand its meaning. That's your calling. Build faithfulness among your people, faithfulness to God as your people grow in, in their understanding of his word and their duty then and out of conviction that they need to obey the word of God. And if you're not a pastor, well, dedicate yourself to sitting under the ministry of a faithful gospel-believing preacher who will week in and week out, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, open the Bible up, read it, and then teach it and explain it to you. See, our Christian testimony depends on it. If we are going to be faithful witnesses, like the two witnesses who finally were killed and, and said to be dead in the year 1514, our Christian testimony depends on it. If we're going to follow in their example, this is what makes us witnesses, that we bear testimony to the truth of God's word. Let's pray. Father, I pray that, that your word will not return void, but that even this highly symbolic prophecy now would give us the courage to be faithful to your word, that we would be first uh, wonderfully built up and encouraged and assured, Lord, uh, to see your hand in history and the way that your churches, uh, they might, may have suffered physical death and they may have suffered persecution, but their mission and their testimony and their preaching could not be killed, could not be silenced. Your word will never be silenced. We thank you, Lord, for the legacy of such good churches and preachers as those. And we ask, Lord, that we would be counted as honored to, be fo to follow in their footsteps, Lord. And so we pray that you would give us courage. We pray that you would give us um, patient endurance to, to attend to your scripture, to read it and study it and learn it. And Lord, that you would give us faithful preachers all over the world now. Send workers for the harvest. Uh, Father, because there is a plentiful harvest, send workers for the harvest. We pray in Jesus' name that you would do that and raise up good teachers and preachers, Lord, who will feed your flock and encourage your people and lead them with your holy word until our great King, the Chief Shepherd, returns, because in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. I aim to be back with you on Friday morning with uh, carrying on from verse 8, looking at what happens through the the death and then the resurrection of the witnesses. Until then, God bless you.